Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Play Katawa Shoujo Emmy's Path Part 15A. Yes, there's a reason I'm saying A at the end of that Part 15. There's two different ways we could take to get to Emmy's good ending. And when we hit the decision gate, I'll delve deeper. Anyways, let's continue the story. Bolstered by this new thought, I've managed to calm down considerably by the time Emmy knocks on our front door. Hey mom, open up, we're here! The door swings open and Miss Aberazaki stands grinning at her daughter. The grin is still surprisingly similar to Emmy's. I'm never going to get used to that. You know, people normally wait for a few minutes before they start shouting at the door. And most mothers say hello to their daughters instead of scolding them right away. Oh, of course. Welcome home, dear. I've missed you. An affectionate hug later, we're inside. And it is only then that Emmy's mom seems to remember that I'm actually here. And hello to you too, Hisao. How are you? I'm quite well, thank you. Nice to not have school to worry about for a little bit. Ah, yes, you finished up your exams, haven't you? That must be quite a relief for you both. It's certainly a weight off of my mind, that's for sure. Mine too. I think I slept well for the first time in weeks last night from relief alone. If this news is a surprise to Emmy's mother, she doesn't show it. Still, her response betrays a note of interest. Is that so? I'm very glad to hear that, Emmy. You know I get worried when you get all wound up about, well, exams. Certainly Emmy's mother knows something I don't. Or rather, she doesn't know that Emmy's told me about the nightmares. It's interesting being able to observe how Miss Aberazaki covers for Emmy. That protective instinct to make sure that I don't know any more than Emmy's willing to tell me. I suppose Emmy's got more in common with Quarks than I ever realized. Moves around fast, impossible to understand through direct observation, yet she has an effect on everyone she encounters. I wonder if Miss Aberazaki will figure out that I know about the nightmares, or is she just keeping everything secret from everybody? Yeah, it's not been as bad this year as in the past. Kisel helped me to stay focused. Okay, I know that's not true. She even cut off contact outside of school hours during exam week. But she did see me during the day, and she told me more than once that the morning run was the only thing she looked forward to during exams. So maybe it's not that much of a lie. Either way, to hear that being around has helped even a little makes me feel a bit better. Emmy's mother raises an eyebrow at this statement. Either she doesn't believe Emmy or she's as surprised as I am. Well, then it appears that it's a good thing you two have become so close. I'd tell you to take good care of my daughter, he Sal, but it looks like you've already, you're already doing that. Emmy grins at this and seems to take pride in my having managed to in ingratiate myself with her mother so easily. Actually, I'd say your daughter's been the one taking care of me. She's got me out and running. I've probably been more active since meeting her than I ever was, even before. I'd actually never thought of it that much, nor had I even appreciated the humor in it. I wasn't too active before the heart attack. Pick-up games of soccer don't really count since they weren't that common. So now that I know for sure that I have a weak heart, now I run every day, pushing my luck with the help of my medication. I chuckle quietly, then realize that I never finished my sentence. Well, before I had my heart attack and wound up at school here... It comes out so casually. There was a time that I would have thought twice about talking about what was wrong with me at all. But now... Now it just seems silly to care, especially in the company of Emmy and our mother. If Emmy could be cavalier about her disability, then so could I. I think back to the track meet where Emmy declared herself the fastest thing on no legs. The fact of her obvious losses never seemed to bother her, at least not in public. Being stuck in the wheelchair frustrated her, I know, but even then, but even that was something she dealt with on her own, despite my efforts to the contrary. Emmy has a way of bringing out the more active side in people. I've never quite figured out how she does it. Those puppy dog eyes she gets for starters! <laughs> I'm not surprised that she managed to rope you into an exercise routine. If Rin weren't just as stubborn as she is, I'm sure that Emmy would have gotten her out and running with you, too. Oh, that reminds me. Rin says hello. I drift to the outer edges of the conversation again as we move into the dining room to eat. It smells delicious in here, and, and the spread that Emmy's mom has produced is impressive. Whoa, you've made enough to feed an army in here! Is it too much? Well, you can always take some leftovers with you when you go. That sounds great. I could only handle cafeteria food for so long. Something home-cooked would be a welcome change of pace. What he said. Thanks, Mom. 
The food tastes as good as it smells, and there's a lull in the conversation while we all dig in. Emmy assaults her plate with the usual amount of gusto, and I will admit that I set a pretty fast pace myself. So, he Sal, I hear that you and my daughter here have gotten rather close, hmm? The urge to say something like, not really, is so strong that I open my mouth to say it, but then reassert control. We are close, there's no getting around it. I mean, Emmy's brought me here, hasn't she? Fortunately, both Emmy and her mother seem to take my reaction as a sign that I'm caught off guard rather than considering saying something cruel. Heh, <laughs> I suppose we have. I blame the morning runs myself. You make it sound like a bad thing, he Sal. Well, I for one found it a relief. Why's that? Emmy's always been a popular girl, but never made any close friends. This is a bit of news to me. I've always seen Emmy chatting with her classmates in the hallways. And certainly the whole track team seems to love her, but is it true that she chooses to isolate herself during lunch with Ren and me? Not exactly the sort of behavior one expects from a popular girl, after all. Then again, I've experienced her unwillingness to get close firsthand, so I can't say that I'm that surprised. I was beginning to have my doubts. Emmy rolls her eyes to the ceiling and grumbles something I can't quite make out. Huh? What? What's that you just said? Nothing. Miss Ibarazaki chokes on her drink with laughter. You've been hanging out with the nurse too long, Emmy. I'm going to have to talk to him about corrupting my daughter. Somehow I don't think that would be very effective. I learned most of it from you anyway, not the nurse. Evil eyes! Don't listen to her, he Sal. She's a born liar. Huh, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I don't know, Emmy. I think your mother has a point. What? You traitor! You're supposed to take my side in this. Yeah, but you did lie about your... Ow, ow, ow. A kick in the shins from an unmistakably plastic foot cuts me off, but not before Mr. Barazaki's eyebrows shoot upwards. What about your leg? It wasn't a big deal, that's all. I was just... I just was... Er... In a wheelchair for a bit. The last few mumbled words are quickly deciphered by Emmy's mother. I suspect she has experience with this sort of thing, and a worried frown appears on her face. So that's why you kept dodging my calls. Oh, Emmy, I know how much you hate being in a wheelchair. No wonder you've been in such a mood lately. Yeah, she's much happier on her feet, so to speak. Well, of course, she spent enough time in a chair just after the accident. She didn't get prosthetics immediately? No, she had to finish healing up before they'd let her start that sort of therapy you've got to go to. Go through to adjust to those things. Especially since she wanted to run on them. I had no idea. Yeah, it sucked. Oh, did you see Rin's mural at the festival? Emmy's sudden change of topic makes me realize belatedly that she's been fidgeting the whole time her mother and I have been talking. I should have figured on her being a little skittish when it comes to talking about the accident, even around her mother. No, I didn't make it out up to the festival, remember? Although I caught a glimpse of it at your track meet, it seemed pretty weird to me. I think that's more or less what she was going for. She talked a lot about it being dreamlike, or trying to make it dreamlike. Rin's art is one of those things I don't think I'll ever understand. That's not surprising! I don't think Rin expects to be understood. She told me once that art allows people to understand stuff they wouldn't understand otherwise, but all the same, she doesn't think it actually works that way. I'm surprised that Emmy's talked about this with Rin extensively enough to actually have Rin's opinion, such as it is. Although I expect that Rin could not, if she were so inclined, say the same thing about Emmy's. Unless, of course, Emmy is purposely keeping me in the dark about everything, which is likely but unpleasant to think about. I drift down this unpleasant train of thought for a while, losing track of the conversation. Hey, Emmy, I've been meaning to ask. Huh? Are you going to visit your father this year? From the way she says it, you'd think Emmy's mother was talking about the weather. From the way Emmy reacts, it's clearly not the weather they're talking about. She flinches, a slight jerk of the head backwards as if she's just been slapped in the face. Can we talk about this later? Her voice sounds brittle, strained. It looks as if she's been severely shaken by the question. 
It seems that Mr. Barazaki misjudged just how close Emmy and I are. Some things, it seems, are best not conversed about with me around. Her father is one of, one of these things. The accident that took her legs is probably another one of those things, if her reaction to the earlier conversation between her mother and myself is any indication. It doesn't take Emmy's mother long to realize she's screwed up. Of course we can, dear. I'm sorry to bring it up. I just wanted to ask so I can make plans. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Emmy fidgets nervously, as if embarrassed by her own reaction. I confess that her reaction is confusing. She only just mentioned her father to me earlier today. Less than a few hours ago, even. Why does a simple question about when she'll visit her father cause such a strong reaction? Unless whatever serenity she claimed to have reached by means of our talk the previous evening has suddenly evaporated. Or it didn't help as much as she thought, or claimed. I'll, uh, be right back. Gotta visit the little girl's room. Emmy gets up suddenly and leaves the table, leaving me and Mr. Barazaki alone. I'm a little conflicted. Should I go after her, or should I stay here? It's obvious that Emmy's departure was not based on the call of nature. Something's bothering her, and I have to know what it is. How to go about it. Okay. This is where things go off in different directions, sort of. I mean, one, one of these will take you to the bad ending, but you could also save yourself and still get to the good ending, no matter what, so... Talk to her mom is the safe option. It takes you to a, it takes you on the safer way to the good ending. Go after her, you're kind of risking going towards the bad ending. And for part 15A, we're going to take the safe route and talk to her mother. There's an awkward silence at the table for a while after Emmy dashes off. I can't think of anything to say. Emmy's mother sighs, breaking the silence. Sorry about that, Hisao. I sometimes forget that Emmy's touchy about certain subjects. And I was talking about the wheelchair thing, too. Should I go after her? Heavens no. She didn't leave the table to continue the conversation, you know. But if she's troubled, shouldn't someone help her? If it were anyone else, I'd say yes. But my daughter is stubborn as a mule. And if she wants to be alone, it's best to let her be alone. Otherwise, she'll probably say something she'd regret. Which would cause you to say something you'd regret. And I would prefer that dinner doesn't end with one or, the, or one of both of you storming out of the house. If that were to happen, I'd be a terrible hostess, wouldn't I? I've already acted as a fool once today. That's okay, I shouldn't have brought up the wheelchair, apparently. Miss Ibarazaki frowns, clearly more bothered by Emmy's omission than she'd let on. I wish she wouldn't do that. It just makes me worry more, you know? She does this often? What? Running off to the bathroom? No, I can't say she does. Keep injuries from her mother, though? Well, that's a little more common. Every time I catch her lying like that, she assures me that the only reason she didn't tell me is because it wasn't a big deal. If it's any consolation, I'm sure the only reason I knew about it at all was because I saw her every day. This, elici this elicits a dry chuckle from across the table. Mr. Barazaki sighs a little sadly. <sighs> Still hesitant about getting close to people, huh? I keep hoping that she'll get over that. It's funny, really. She's bounced back so well from the accident in so many ways. I guess some things never really go away. From the looks of it, the whole thing still bothers her, too. She seems to be a little more willing to talk about the accident without Emmy around, though. Hey, I've got a question, if it's alright. Oh? What else did Emmy lose in that accident? The nurse said that she gets this way near the anniversary and she won't talk about it to me. So you thought I'd fill you in, hmm? Er, uh, yeah, hopefully. Well, there's a problem with that request, you know. Let me guess, you promised Emmy that you wouldn't tell anyone she didn't want to know, and you don't know if she wants me to, no. Something like that. I promised Emmy that she'd be the one to tell people the full story. But isn't that important? I mean, it's clearly had a huge effect on her, and if she's still like this for so long after the accident happened... And if she's still like this after so long after the accident happened... That's true, it did have a long-lasting effect on her. There are a few things that she'll probably never really get over. For a moment, Miss Ibarazaki looks incredibly saddened, as if an old wound is bothering her. I suppose there are a few things I'll never really get over either. 
Another dry chuckle, and with a shake of her head, Emmy's mother banishes the memory. Look, there's something you absolutely must understand about the way Emmy thinks about the accident. What's that? It wasn't a big deal. Somehow I managed to keep my mouth from falling open in surprise, but it takes some effort. That has to be the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I beg your pardon? Okay, maybe it's not that simple. But it's a pretty accurate summation. Emmy believes that the accident did not define her, and that everything she lost that day didn't define her either. She's not that girl who lost her legs. She's the fastest thing on no legs. Her optimism and energy came out of that wreck without a scratch, as far as she's concerned. Yet, it goes beyond that, doesn't it? I mean, last night she told me that she refused to rely on me because it would make, me lose, make losing me too painful. Not really. You said she won't tell you about the accident, even though you've asked her about it before. The reason she won't talk about it when you ask is because it's, to her it's not something you absolutely need to know. Even if she wasn't terrified of getting too close to anyone, she still wouldn't talk about it. She's afraid of being close to me? Oh goodness me, yes. For all that talk about being unscathed by the accident, she's gained the ugly knowledge of how quickly it could all be over. So she's not going to let people get especially close to her, and she certainly would resent any implication that she cannot work through this on her own. But I don't think she can. Oh, no? Are you sure you've been dating my daughter and not somebody else? Trust me, Hisao, she can get through it on her own. But she has nightmares and can't sleep well, and... And she does this every year. Tell me, if she wasn't able to get through it on her own, do you really think she'd still be alive? She would have killed herself for something equally melodramatic. So what, I shouldn't try to help her? I didn't say that. I hate seeing my daughter like this, and knowing that she could rely on someone else would let me relax. You just need to understand that accepting help goes against everything Emmy thinks about herself and the way the world works. If you still want to offer her help, then I guess that's your call. Honestly, I'd like you to, but it'd be silly not to warn you that it's not going to be easy. You just need to be patient with her. She's already closer to you than anyone else she's ever met at Yamaku. Well, it sure doesn't feel like we're very close. Good. That makes this part easier. Oh boy. Emmy's voice nearly gives me a heart attack. Whoa! Didn't hear you come back, Emmy. How convenient. Wait, were you eavesdropping? Nope, just happened to come back at the right moment, I guess. Emmy, he saw was just... Emmy holds up a finger, cutting her mother off. On his way out of the house? Yeah, I know. Emmy's trembling with anger now, looking vaguely betrayed. Emmy, don't be ridiculous, we were just... You promised! The pain carried in that last word is almost too much for me to bear. The idea that I could hurt her that much is like being kicked in the gut. Emmy's mother looks similarly pained by the thought. And I kept that promise. Just listen. There's no reason to go throwing people out of the house. Emmy's mother seems to be both angry at her daughter's outburst and embarrassed that I'm a witness to it. There's only one real solution to this problem, I think. It's okay, I'll go. Not really, that, it, that seems a little unnecessary. Don't worry about it. Thank you for the dinner, Mr. Burizaki, and for the advice. It was my pleasure, Hiso. I'm sorry we didn't get to the dessert. That's okay, I have to wash what I eat anyway. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, I mean, Mr. Burizaki. The formality of our conversation coupled with the fact that I'm getting ready to leave seems to snap Emmy out, out of her anger. No, no, wait, I'm sorry. I've been so... And after last night, I just thought, you don't have to go. I take it back. It's okay. I can't help but smile slightly. She could barely articulate her apology, and I really would like to stay. But I don't think I can, right now. I need to think about what her mother said and about what I'm going to do about us. I don't want to risk accidentally getting Emmy angry again in our current state, either. No, I think I'd better leave. You seem pretty shook up, and, well, I'd only wind up trying to help you again. I know you'd prefer I didn't, so I'm going to leave instead. But... 
Hey, it's not a problem. You don't want a knight on a white charger, right? Just promise me one thing, okay? What? Don't be angry at your mom, okay? She was just giving me some advice, that's all. Emmy, no Emmy nods, hesitantly. Like, this simple idea is all that she can grab onto at this point. She's so terribly off balance that I can't do anything about that right now. Okay. See you tomorrow, okay? Running in the mornings. Don't forget! I can see that I've hurt Emmy by deciding to leave, but there's nothing I can do for her as things stand. And I know that she's too stubborn to admit that she wants me to stick around. I watch various emotions cross Emmy's face as she tries to process everything that's just happened. Shortly c comes that calm look again, like last night, and that voice that tries so hard to sound careless. Sure, he Sal. See you around. Both of us are unwilling to concede emotion at this point, and I'm having a hard time keeping up my facade, so I turn on my heel and walk out the door. I shut it behind me slowly, pausing for a moment as the latch catches, my hand on the doorknob. Did I make the right decision just now? Should I have stayed and tried to work things out? No, I decide. Not in front of her mother like that. In spite of everything, I'd rather keep Emmy's mother insulated from the sort of anger that, I, that surfaced last night. Even though she's probably used to it, some protective instinct wants me to keep Emmy's image as a cheerful girl intact. With a start, I realize my hand is still resting on the knob. I take my hand away, put it in my pocket, and head down the slowly darkening street. I let out a long breath. The wait until tomorrow morning comes isn't going to be easy. In any case, I have to think on what to say to Emmy. I must apologize, and I must get through to her somehow. On that account, something has been on my mind for most of the way back to my room. The letter of apology from Iwanako. I was so concerned about my new life when I received it that I didn't even bother to really read it. Now that I find myself in a similar position, my curiosity got rekindled. What did she want to let me know so badly? If nothing else, reading her thoughts might help me frame, help me frame mine. I remember tossing it away. Damn, where did I throw that thing? I check under my desk. That turns up nothing, so I look for harder to reach, more unlikely locations. Well, now I know where that lost sock went, at least. Still no letter, though. It's when I try sweeping my arm under my nightstand that I feel something crinkly jammed between it and the wall. Grunting a little with the effort, I reach for my prize and soon manage to bring it into the light. Bingo! I sit at my desk and spread the crumpled paper open. A flick turns on the table light. Skipping past the empty pleasantries, I look for the point where I stopped reading. Ah, here it is. There are other things I want to say. I'm writing to you because I felt that there are things I should have said after the incident back in winter. I really regret that I wasn't able to say them in person, and I have no excuse for it. The truth is, the times when I visited you at the hospital made me worry about you. I am not talking about your health. You seem to become more distant and disheartened. It was natural after something like that happened. I'm sure, but somehow I got the feeling that you had given up on something back then. Happiness, maybe? Giving up on happiness. This sounds unpleasantly familiar. I wanted to somehow express my feelings, but the right words didn't come to me. I couldn't say anything to comfort you. I am really sorry for not being able to support you when it mattered the most. Even though I like you so much, at least now finally I can be more honest. If I could go back to those quiet days in February and March, I'd tell you to not give up on yourself. That's what I would say. Maybe you wouldn't have drifted so far away if I had just said something. I hope you've managed to get back on your feet on your own. Now that the distance between us is also physical, it also feels more final, somehow. I wonder if we will meet again. Perhaps it's for the best if we don't. Still, if you would like to correspond with me, by all means write me back. I'd very much like to hear about your new school and how you are doing. I wish you all the best. Sincerely, Iwanako. After finishing reading that, the letter, I smoothed it out carefully and set it aside on my desk. Thank you, Iwanako. I wanted to answer yes to your question on that snowy winter day, but I never got to. By the time we met again, it was too late. Or so I thought. What would have happened if I had behaved differently back in that dis dismally sterile hospital room? I'm sorry, there's no point in wondering now, but there's no point in trying to forget either. I am who I am because of all that happened to me and, uh, and all I look forward to experience. Wait, let me read that again. I am 
who I am because of all that happened to me and all I look forward to experience, present, future, and past. And the past may just have taught me an important lesson now. And we're heading right into Act 4. Yeah, but Part 15A will continue because there's a little more difference on this, uh, on this route than there is the other one. Taking the rougher road. And I didn't get to announce the act, because I, it went by too quickly. I'll do it for part 15b. Anyways, the sound of my alarm is an unwelcome intrusion on a sleep that's been a battle to obtain. I doubt I've been truly asleep for more than an hour or two. Too much on my mind. Did I make the right choice leaving the house yesterday? Did I manage to get Emmy to realize how unreasonable she's been? Am I ever going to manage to get her to stop being unreasonable? Emmy's mom gave me a new perspective the other day, but I'm still not sure that it's the right perspective. She was hurt when I left yesterday, too. I know that part of my, I know that part of any conversation is going to have to include an apology about that. Right thing to do or not, I heard her. I hurried down to the track eager to talk to Emmy. I think I know what to say. Apologize for leaving first and go ahead from there. Unless, of course, Emmy doesn't show up. Which, from the looks of things, seems like it's the case. It's been about 15 minutes since I got here and there's no sign of her. She's never late, not unless she's sick, which is unlikely. She probably just doesn't want to see me right now. To take my mind off what that implies, I begin my warm-up routine and take off around the track. It clears my mind wonderfully for the half hour I'm running. I don't think about anything but the run. However, once I've finished and Emmy still hasn't shown up, I get a little worried. With any luck, the nurse will know where she is. If nothing else, I could see what he thinks I should do next. So, last night didn't go too well, I take it. Huh? You already knew? No? I have my ways, and it's not as if I'd missed the distinct absence of your running partner this morning, now would I? No, I suppose not. So, what happened? Don't you know already? Maybe, but I could be bluffing. Perhaps I'd prefer to get your side of the story before I give any advice. I quickly fill the nurse in on the events of last night, and he takes it all in without changing expression once. Nothing about the whole event seems to surprise him, although he does seem surprised when I say that I didn't follow Emmy. Chose to talk to her mom instead, huh? Smart move. Though I guess it didn't work out too well for you in the end. Well, I'm not sure. Emmy seemed apologetic when I left, or at least she seemed that way until she put up her defenses again. The nurse sighs and spreads his hands in a conciliatory gesture. Frankly, I'm surprised she let them down at all. Emmy's had a lot of practice on that score. You probably won't get anything else out of her. I don't believe you. Is that so? You think she'll tell you the whole tale? I swear I just saw the nurse's eyes glitter a little. His expression is the same, but he leans forward ever so slightly. I think she'll open up if I ask her without being an idiot about it, yeah. The nurse gives his enigmatic smile and response and shrugs widely. I think he's enjoying his role a little too much. That's the real trick, isn't it? Are you sure you know the right way to approach the subject? I can guarantee that Emmy's going to try her hardest to pretend last night didn't happen. It will be painfully awkward for the both of you, but it'll also be a lot safer than trying to ask her for the whole story again. It could go worse this time. Are you ready for something like that? It sounds like a challenge, like he doesn't believe for a minute that I'd be so bold. I actually feel a little insulted by his lack of confidence in me. Of course I'm ready for that. I love her. My outburst gets a raised eyebrow in response. Well then. Good luck. Let me know how it all turns out. Although he delivers his parting shot with the same smirk as usual, I actually think that the nurse wants me to succeed. I resist the urge to charge directly to Emmy's room to prove the nurse wrong. I've gone in half-cocked before, and the results were less than stellar. If I'm going to do this, I need to figure out exactly what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it. Something to think about in class. Yeah, I'm going to go a little over the 30-minute mark, because this route, it, it's a little longer than the other one, I think. I could be wrong. I kind of forgot. Sure enough, by the time lunch rolls around, I think I have a good enough idea of what to say. I could do this. The bell rings and I grab my lunch and dash up to the stairs, eager to be there first. I'll need to ask Rin to leave, and I'll need to... 
Hi, he Sal. Sorry I wasn't able to run with you this morning. I overslept. Somehow both Emmy and Rin have managed to get to the roof before me. Oh, that's no problem. Last night was kind of draining, I guess. Emmy's expression doesn't alter in the slightest. Yeah, sorry about that, but I've had such a weird morning since then. Oh, uh, really? Emmy proceeds to make small talk for the rest of the time. I could barely get a word in edgewise and soon find myself interjecting with a sort of back-and-forth dialogue that seems to have defined our early relationship. I'm not going to get anywhere on this problem during lunch, obviously. I can respect that. Emmy obviously doesn't want to accidentally pull Rin into things, and that's fine. Not that I think Rin would notice, but I can at least respect that sort of rationale. I try a different tactic. Hey, Emmy, what are you up to after class today? I was thinking we could go somewhere for dinner or something. Emmy looks genuinely remorseful. Sorry, Hesel, I promised the track captain that I'd stick around after practice and help some of the other kids with their form. It'll have to be some other time. Yeah, sure. I'm honestly not sure what to do now. Maybe diving into things the day after would be a bad idea anyway. She might still be angry about it and sh just not showing it. Besides, if she's got track team responsibilities, that's fine, right? I tell myself some variation on this theme the next day, then the next. I wake up, run with Emmy, during which she refuses to talk about anything but the run and what she was doing the night before, and then lunch where we sit and make small talk until the bell rings. Her new responsibilities effectively keeping me from seeing her outside of school. Maybe, just maybe, I'm letting it happen because it's safer this way, just like the nurse said. Except while it may be safer, I'm feeling more and more wretched. Emmy doesn't look good when I see her anymore. Dark circles lurk under her eyes. She seems more and more distracted, and I can't bring myself to just ask what's wrong, because the timing never seems right. I'm absolutely miserable. And another day ends, and I might actually be pushing this part out a little longer than normal. Because I want to get all of 15A in. I want you guys to see this whole good route leading into the good ending. Another lunch comes. I trudge up the stairs to the rooftop like a condemned man. Rin is up there, but Emmy is not. Immediately, I worry that something's happened to her. Maybe the lack of sleep finally made her collapse or something worse. She seemed pretty tired after our morning run. Maybe she fell asleep and didn't even make it to class. Hey, Rin, where's Emmy? In response, I get a rather penetrating look from Rin, and something approaching a frown appears on her face. Is that information really important? I think so. She's usually here with you, isn't she? I don't know. I have no way of being sure. I can confirm that she is, in fact, usually here with you when I come up. Well, she isn't now. Does that worry you? Kind of. Hmm. That seems to end the conversation, and the point becomes moot anyway, because Emmy bounds through the door with her usual energy. He sounds kind of worried about you, Emmy. I don't think he could decide, or maybe I just don't believe him. But I think I'm going to go somewhere less awkward now. I'm so surprised by Rin's being so suddenly forward about, well, anything at all that I merely watch her head through the door. Emmy is similarly surprised and colors slightly crimson as she stares open mouth at me. It occurs to me that I should probably say something, if only to break the awkward silence that has suddenly descended. It's because you weren't here yet. I was, uh, worried about it. Why? You're usually here, so I was worried that something had happened to you. This isn't the first time that I've been late, you know. Did you get worried all the other times, too? Er, not really. Emmy seems slightly amused by this. I don't know why, but that kind of pisses me off. So, why was this time an exception? Maybe it's the light, teasing tone of the question, but something in her response pushes me to be honest, though I can't help snapping at her when I say it. Because you've been worrying me since dinner at your house, that's why. Well, now it's out in the open, and Emmy's eyes are wide, and she looks like she wants to bolt, but she doesn't. Ah, still on that, I see. What, you think I'm supposed to just forget about it? You threw me out of your house! We've been going on for almost a week pretending it never happened. I didn't see you bringing it up either, you know. I know, and I'm sorry that was the case. We have to address it, or we'll just keep up this whatever it is we got right now. It's killing me to look at how you look right now. Did you know that? Those circles under your eyes and that distracted look in them? And I can't help worrying that I've caused it somehow. 
You haven't, trust me. Well, I haven't helped either. I keep pushing you to tell me things you aren't ready to tell me. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong to try getting your mother to help me out, but I've been so worried about you that I didn't know what else to do. Well, you don't have to worry about me anymore, okay? I think it's pretty clear we're not right for each other, so maybe we should just stop. Her face is twisted up as she says this, like she doesn't want to say it, but forces herself to anyway. You don't actually want that, do you? Heck, you can barely bring yourself to say it. Anyway, it won't keep me from worrying about you. I care too much about you to just stop on command. You don't want to tell me what's wrong, that's fine. But I won't stop trying to help you, even if it's just standing by you. Stop saying that! She's shaking now, and as, as she looks at me, I can't see if she's a... I can see she's afraid and frustrated and a million different things all at once. I shake my head slowly and take a few steps towards her. You know what your mom told me? She told me that you never ask for help, because you know that you're strong enough to get through anything on your own. But that's not the full story, is it? Her eyes go wide and she takes a step back. I keep going, because I think I finally figured it out. Something tells me I won't get another shot. I put it off far too long as it is. There's no harm in having someone help you, unless you're worried about needing help in the first place. You're scared, aren't you? Because of... I trail off because I don't know for certain what happened to Emmy's father, and I don't want to jump to a conclusion. Well, never mind why, but it's okay to be afraid. You've been running from it and from me for so long, even though you know eventually you have to turn around and face your fear, and I'm going to be there to help when you do. I won't stop because I don't think you'd want me to. You can understand that sort of determination, can't you? I can see that I've gotten through to her, but she quickly falls back to anger to try and push me away again. Back on your way, Charger, he said. Gotta help the poor cripple face her emotional problems. What do you know about me and about what I've already had to face? You think two months of learning to walk again was fun? But I did it, and after I did that, I had to... For a moment, it seems as if she's going to say something else, but she cuts herself off. And after all that, you don't think you can get past your fear? Emmy, I can't fathom what you have been through, but to come through it and still be the sort of girl that you are, well, it makes me think that you have even more strength than you think. So I'm not going to help you because I think you need rescuing. I don't want to be a knight rescuing the damsel in distress, but even knights helped each other out, you know. I want to help you even though I know you can do it on your own. For a moment, it looks like Emmy's going to break down completely, but she doesn't. Tears run down her face, but she stares at me steadily. Why are you trying so hard to help me? I'd say that it's because I owe you one for helping me out when we first met. But that wouldn't be the truth. The truth is, I just want you to be happy because I love you. Had I ever said that before? We've been in a relationship and it's been pretty obvious that I love her, but did I ever actually speak the words? What did you say? I say it again, savoring the feeling of being able to say it at all. Being able to say it and mean it. Emmy seems stunned. I said I love you, Emmy. I love you. Just you, and that makes me want to stand by you, no matter what you have to face. I'm wrapped in a fierce hug, then, as Emmy begins to sob against my chest. I'm sorry! I'm so sorry about everything, but I'm so scared, he sell. I'm so scared of losing you, and I love you, too. But I can't lose you, I just... I'm so sorry! I hold her quietly, shushing her until she settles down. She steps back a little more composed. Will you come with me tomorrow? Back to my house? There are some things I need to show you if I'm going to do this. Of course. Maybe this time we can leave together instead of separately. Emmy grins, a sudden flash of brightness that seems more genuine than anything I've seen in the past week. Yeah, maybe. The lunch bell rings and I curse the universe's poor sense of timing. Are you free tonight? We could talk more then, right? Emmy shakes her head. Sorry, Hisao, but I'm still helping the track team. Plus, I don't think it would be good if we talked this over tonight. I'm going to be too tired to think properly, and I want to be able to tell you everything without screwing it up. You can wait, right? Even now, there's a bit of fear in her voice. I smile and rest a hand on her shoulder. Okay, I'll be waiting. Emmy gives me a quick kiss before she heads for the stairwell. Thanks, Hisao. See you tomorrow morning. Wouldn't miss it. I head down the stairs with the feel of her lips on mine, suddenly aware of how much I've missed that sensation. I'll have to remember to thank Ren for getting us to talk to one another. Although it's possible she won't even realize what she's done, still, if not for her, I, I doubt I'd have ever been able to confront Emmy again. 
I guess I needed more help than I realized. Tomorrow, however, I'll need to stand alone through whatever Emmy's trying to work herself up to doing. I'll be up to the task, I hope. And with that, folks, that's going to end part 15A. So that's the good route to take to the good ending of Emmy's path. And now stay tuned, folks, for the next time when I do Let's Play Katawa Shoujo Emmy's Path Part 15B, where we're going to take the harder road to get back to the good ending. And that one's definitely going to have a lot more drama, I'll tell you that right now. Anyways, see you for that one, peoples.